So uh, a lot of interesting points. I think um, one of the studies that was probably most informative on that is, was Ty Cannon's study of patients who were converting from the prodrome to actual psychosis and showing that they had brain changes that were unassociated with any antipsychotic drug treatment because they hadn't been exposed to antipsychotic drugs. We've also seen some studies recently suggesting that with each relapse, the time to response is reduced. And the group at the University of Toronto studied about 130 first episode schizophrenia patients demonstrating that. And I you think mean those the are. The time to response is longer. Time to response is longer. And the, likely, in the, in the, and the likelihood in, of response, is, right? Is, so is that, a, is that a, a pathway to treatment resistance, for example, that if you, if you experience multiple episodes, you're more likely to become treatment resistant? We know that maybe 15 to 20 percent of patients are treatment resistant from the get go, but then there's a, another cadre of patients who develop treatment resistance over time. So, you know, there are many, many concerns, um, obviously, about people experiencing multiple relapses. I mean, there is, there is the other side. There is a group of people who has a psychotic episode or even meets criteria for schizophrenia who stop taking meds and don't relapse. Right. And, right. We, and that's a small percentage. How many you know? of those have you seen? We don't see those people. I think that's part of the challenge. I mean, and there, there certainly there have been recent studies that have raised those questions again. You know, people experiencing dosage reduction and doing okay, and it's, I think it's... Well, John, you, you, you did, I mean, you're probably uh, the, the person, the mo pioneer of uh, trying to evaluate how you can determine minimum effective dose. And you did a number of studies that tried to uh, find the, the kind of uh, optimal dosage with minimal side effects and maintaining therapeutic effects. And, and you found in the different ways that uh, that was experimentally pursued, you know, differential levels of, of risk in terms of relapse or in terms of side effects. You know, at this point, where do you come down in terms of, you know, trying to balance those things? So I think we're still left with the question as to whether or not there's a small subgroup of people who may do okay without medication. And right now we don't have any method to identify those patients. So if that represents 5% or 10% of the people that we see, we're going to treat 100% with the treatments that we have. But I think people are still you know, asking, well, what, what about the subgroup? Is there is a way that we can identify them? And someday, maybe with the right genomics and the right imaging uh, stratification, we will be able to. But right now, I think we all agree that we want to promote the use of um, medication to prevent relapse. And that's, that's a good segue into the next section. We want to talk about uh, patient adherence and um, the the role you mentioned earlier the role of adherence in in relapse we you know we commented earlier that there are many things that influence people's uh, ability or willingness to take medication unfortunately we don't have good methods to monitor adherence and so what we end up doing most of the time is asking the patient whether he or she is taking the medication and Patients may not be intentionally trying to mislead us. I think very often they don't know themselves how much medication they've missed. So we may do things like pill counts or use MEMS caps, or, but we're not going to do frequent blood levels. And we have a hard time identifying those patients who are, who are non-adherent. So I think monitoring is a big problem. And one of the advantages, of, I think, of the long-acting formulations is that you know, even if we were to say that they, they may not be superior in some respects, we, we know that we can identify non-adherence immediately when someone misses an injection. So that, that is an enormous advantage um, in and of itself. I want to make sure people know what MEMS caps are. There, oh, I sure. think that's a, yes. it's, it's a brand name yes, of uh, electronic compliance monitoring, and it's a thing that lets you know when people open the pill bottles. Right. And so if they're not opening the pill bottles, you know that they're not using them. If they are opening the pill bottles, they, they don't know if they're ingesting it, right. them. Yeah, absolutely. And and people use prescription refill rates. I mean, you can get data from large, you know, from large organizations telling you whether or not the prescription was filled. So, it, again, it's it's we have limited ways to uh, to monitor adherence. Um, so, you know, what else could we be doing to improve adherence? Obviously, there there have been you know behavioral strategies. People doing group therapy to try to increase the motivation to take medication. It's part of the therapeutic alliance, trying to educate patients about medication. But at the end of the day, certainly in my hospital, it seems like half of the readmissions 
of people with psychosis are due to non-adherence. And so we, we still have a long way to go. I, I think that's right. I think inpatient units are filled with people who've stopped their medications, yeah. What about um, the introduction of, of the so-called atypical oral medication, Scott? Do you think that that helped in terms of improving adherence? I think we hoped that it would because the newer medications were, um, had different side effects or had fewer of the side, older side effects. They didn't have so many neurological side effects that seemed to be such a problem. Um, and so the hope was that they would work really well and not have side effects and therefore people would take them. And you know, unfortunately, that it didn't make much of a difference, I think, the oral atypicals. I mean, they're, they're good medications, they're efficacious, but they, as far as I know, they didn't have any big advantages on, on, uh, on adherence. Yeah, there were a few studies that suggested maybe some small advantages, and uh, they certainly were an advance in terms of reducing some of the neurologic side effects, but then it turned out that there were metabolic side effects that were somewhat more common. So.